Hello, everybody, and welcome along to the Event Industry News Podcast. My name is James Dixon, and as always, I wish you a very good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening, whenever or wherever you tune in to our podcast today from. Um, and delighted to have two guests on um, on today's podcast. I always love having more than one guest because it means I can do less talking and let our guests lead the way. Um, joining us today uh, from TRO, um, we've got CEO Mike Worley-Birch and client partner Lucy Nil. Mike and Lucy, thank you very much for joining the podcast today. It's great to have you here. Thank you, James. Hello, James. Joining us, Happiness joining us for, for those watching the video on the eventinternews.com website, joining us from very nicely configured locations, guys. Um, <laughs> in the grand scheme of locations that we've had on the podcast in the last 12 months, you know, we've had, you know, basements and, you know, underground cellars. And this is this is a very well presented uh, set of guests today um, for anybody who's listening to the audio. So th thanks for joining us, guys. Um, we've got something to talk about today, very specifically on the podcast. Um, and it is a white paper. And I suppose that's that may not be the best way to describe it, but I suppose in the first instance is the best way to describe it, to introduce people to it, guys. Um, Mike, if we can come to you first of all as, as CEO, this is titled Shared Experiences, How to Thrive in a Post-Pandemic Experience Economy. Um, the first thing I'd like to ask on, on the podcast today is what's an experience economy? This is something people have heard about, but are we in a position where we can start defining it? Um, yes, there's many different definitions for it, and a lot of this is what actually drove our um, thinking right at the start, actually pre-pandemic, because, um, you know, experience is a word that's used, you know, by so many different industries and so many different people. And we see it as much broader than just uh, marketing construct experiences, our day to day lives. That is what we do, our human engagement, our human experience. And that's where, you know, from a, when they talk about the experience economy, um, I think it does get hijacked sometimes as being purely, you know, marketing and trying to sell things. Mm -hmm. But actually, experience economy, economy is really driven out the fact that humans are starting to value the experiences and the memories they make from that than perhaps some of the more physical and um, material things that they previously owned. And that's what's really driving it. So it goes anything from holidays to that walk with your friend in the woods. Uh, it's those experiences that people really value. And that's what's driven this whole white paper and where we sort of come in from. And of course, experiences is, is is not just about going to to an event, is it? You know, uh, human interaction and and life experiences can be going shopping with a friend or a family member, um, and the experience of being out with them for the day and having a coffee and a spot of lunch with them. You know, that that's an experience, isn't it? And really, I suppose one thing that we've learnt, Lucy, in the last twelve months is how much a we value those experiences, and potentially how many businesses and, and sectors were undervaluing what delivering a better experience could give to their customers. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, you know, it's that age old kind of saying of you don't know what you've got until it's gone. And although we, you know, we've been kind of working in this shared experiences art, if you like, since, you know, for a couple of years now, actually, when the pandemic hit, and so many of those shared experiences that we all know and love, were literally kind of removed from us overnight. It was it was really interesting to see then how much we really did value them and how we how much we missed them. And I think the pandemic then has has made a a real kind of proof point for the value um, and the the importance that we all need to put in shared experiences moving forward. And I think what was really interesting is that our kind of natural human um, instinct and desire and need for togetherness um, mm -hmm. meant that, and also humans being very kind of uh, innovative, right, and, and resourceful, what it meant that was that we actually started to find new ways of doing shared experiences um, overnight. You know, we were thrown into this into this kind of situation where we had to had to do something differently. And we saw the rise of, you know, virtual events, uh, people suddenly replacing the pub quiz with the, the, the virtual quiz, music concerts coming online, massive rise in gaming. You know, it's been kind of widely reported that everybody at all levels 
CEO levels included are now kind of gaming more than they ever have before. Is that you, Mike? Are you, are you there with your headset? <laughs> absolutely, and been absolutely whipped by my 13-year-old son. <laughs> I, I feel and, your and, pain, Mike. I feel your pain. And, and even um, even for those real life experiences, when when we paired it right back, we saw you know the NHS clapping um, kind of phenomenon on a Thursday evening. That that became a big shared experience in our lives at that time. And although it it, it, it seems such a small thing in sort of the grander scheme of what we would normally talk about when we're talking about shared experiences, that was you know for many of us the only shared experience that we were having at that point in time with our with our neighbors and it, it was that one chance to be all out on the street socially distanced yeah. but but having a form of togetherness and then talking about it on you know whatsapp afterwards did you go and clap like, yeah i went out and clapped <laughs> yeah. and yeah. and the european equivalent with the sort of the balcony parties and and people singing on balconies and and all of that as well it, 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 it really did shape us. Sorry, Mike, go on, please. Uh, it just sort of um, adding to that, it's, and people instinctively were seeking joy and positivity in a really negative moment mm. um, because, you know, the media, you know, rightly it was telling the, you know, giving the facts of this, you know, real tragedy and this pandemic. Um, but if you look at everything, all those shared experiences were people trying to bring happiness and joy and, and, um, see some positivity because that's what we crave as humans. It's we social. We want to come together. That's why we come together for weddings, for parties. Yes. It's one of our most basic needs. And you even saw things like, you know, viral phenomena like Jerusalem, which came out of uh, a South African song. I'm biased here being South African. But from a group of friends in Angola who started doing this dance, and it led to in South Africa being a national day where every school, every person took part in doing this dance. And if you haven't watched it, go and Google it or look it on YouTube. It's literally gone to almost every country in the world. We've got now nuns in Ireland um, through to, you know, police officers to every group who are performing this dance to the song Jerusalem. And it's all about a positive message and hope um, when, you, you know, if you look up the Zulu words that it's based on. It's 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 important today that we turn our attention as as quick as possible to this to this document because there's so much in it and there's so much for us to really sort of get get into and and, and to talk about and dare I say it we won't squeeze it all in in today's podcast but um, I, I look at it and the first thing I think is there's an awful lot of time and effort gone into this you can see that just with the way it's presented but more importantly just by reading the first two paragraphs really of of content that are in there both of those hit me straight away you know it's meaningful from from the get-go um where did the idea for the report come from initially at what stage you know in the last you know 12 months did you think actually this is an opportunity to really do something that could set our own roadmap for the next few years it was something actually if i could pick this one up it's because it's something that's actually was long before the pandemic it's something we actually started in 2019 and where it came from is we we're just looking at the whole marketing platform and you know, it's very easy when you look at a media plan that everything's sort of set out as marketing. And we sort of felt, well, we're in the experience world. You know, we experts at experience. We've been doing this for an awful long time. Mm -hmm. What does that really mean? And what does that mean in our lives? So we actually took it outside of the marketing field. And that's where we really started exploring um, to what does experience mean? And this is point about uh, and it led us to this, the fact that the most powerful experiences, the one that we remember most, the ones that become our stories and anecdotes are the shared experiences. It's when we do something with somebody in person at a live event or even, as I said before, just going for a walk. That little unexpected moment, that shared moment is now shared between you for life and that memory is created. And then that goes on to online, as we saw during the pandemic, that obviously everybody just moved. No one was doing anything different in the online experiences. They were just taking what we'd normally do in a live environment to moving it online. Like as Lisa said, the pub quiz. Um, they didn't invent new things. You know, even Joe Wicks was, you know, a format that we've all known for years, you know, and it's a gym class that's just gone online. Um, and, and that's what really drove our thinking. So it was something that came long before the pandemic and then as to what Lucy said earlier, is it's, it's actually the pandemic was just a proof point for us and actually gave a time for reflection and deep thought and then really drive into it. Uh, so it's something we're very passionate about and believe in. 
Lucy, the, 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 one, sorry, please, yeah. No, sorry, I was just going to say one sort of further proof point, if, if you will, um, on that is when you look at taking away those shared experiences, you know, some of the impact that that, that has had um, negatively in terms of rise of mental health um, issues, you know, economically, um, there, there is so much of our sort of economy that relies on, um, you know, people going out and doing things together um and you know it, it's so much kind of part of our ingrained in in, in what we need mm. the, the, i'm looking here and forgive me for my for my attention being diverted but I, I i the page that i'm looking at here defines the three dimensions of a shared experience and this to me is one of the real sort of fascinating things to pull out in person online and they're obvious, maybe. The first two are obvious. But the third one is the one that, in culture, a, an experience that has a lasting relevance within a community through shared stories, values, behaviours or objects. Um, and this really, I suppose, if you want something to go into that particular dimension, into the in-culture bit, this is where you have to go right back to ground zero, isn't it? And think, what are we developing in the first place? How are we going to develop it? What is the content going to be? You know, what is that experience? If we want somebody to get to that third dimension of adopting it in culture and remembering it, you really do have to go right the way back to the opposite end of the timeline, don't you? Yeah, exactly. And and this isn't about kind of um, culture in, in the sort of the, the lofty sense. I guess that what this is about is kind of ingraining those memories into kind of people's anecdotes and, and everyday lives and memories and, and things that will live on. And, and we know that by doing things together, um, it's it's so much more impactful. So, you know, one of the sort of quotes in there is from a, a study done at, at Yale University where they had people just eating chocolate. Uh, and if two people were eating chocolate together, they were describing the experience of eating the chocolate kind of so much more passionately and so much more enjoyable than if one person was eating chocolate by themselves and the other person was you know doing something else so i guess it's it's exactly as you say it's it's kind of making sure that um that those opportunities and those considerations are taken in kind of right at the beginning um and you've got ideally all of those components you know you 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 have that live element um you have the online um kind of to extend that reach and, and amplification and make it more accessible for, for perhaps people who who can't be there in person um and that you are generating something that is actually meaningful for the people that are taking part and if if you're well enough aligned with your audience and what their needs and their interests are then that should go quite a long way to making sure that those are kind of ongoing livable memories and shareable content because people are enjoying it they'll share it well being being aligned with your with your audience is is, is the key thing here isn't it mike because i think pre-pandemic we'd maybe got to a stage where as a society things have become dispose everything had become quick and disposable it content included advertising included events included you know it was you could generate content so quickly and put it out there so quickly via social media platforms and via the internet that people may be guilty of not putting as much thought into what they were putting out there just a blanket bomb sort of exercise absolutely i think that's where um actually covid's ex um, sort of amplified that because we, our whole lives now exist on screen from the call but to the fact this evening we'll be watching Netflix or whatever it may be and so therefore there's this massive demand for uh, for new content and you're starting to see all the replays and everything else and it was faulty Towers on BBC One the other night and you know that was something that used to live on BritBox and it's this is craving, so that's what's really generated this. And I think culture is when we see what sticks. So culture for us sort of starts at everything starts as an innovation, and as an agency, we're all about innovation and what's the new, you know, how can we really have cut through? Mm. And that innovation then maybe becomes a trend, but trends come and go like fashion. Culture is when that trend sticks, and it suddenly becomes a habit and it becomes a behaviour. So. I think we've got quite an exciting six months to 18 months ahead of us where some of the behaviours that, you know, we have now, will they now become new culture? Will they be adopted? Will we spring back to 
um, you know, previous behaviors. You know, they always say, psychologists say, if you do something for more than 90 days, it becomes a habit. Well, it's certainly feeling like it'll more than 90 days right now. So, you know, it will be what will be a habit, what will be, and actually, I believe there'll be a whole lot of new cultures bringing. And that's where it's key for brands and um, for anybody to ensure you're communicating with your audience in the most relevant way. And I think we're going to have a tension there because you're going to have a demand for sales and drive and sell purely driven by commerce because the reality is an awful lot of businesses have really suffered. And what they may do is spring back to the old playbook of, well, this is what we've got to do. So we've just got to get it out there visible and it's got to be the old P's, you know, product placement and price. And um, and I think it's going to be far deeper than that, um, that actually you've got to really be talking to your consumer and your public in the most relevant way, in a way that they want to hear because some of their cultural behaviours may have shifted and their whole value structure may have st shifted over this last um, 12 months. Absolutely. Um, th there's another facet. I'm going to sort of keep throwing elements of the uh, of the document at you during this, because, mm -hmm. as I said, it's it's so interesting to look at just short sentences. Um, An experience doesn't end when the event ends. Shared experiences translate to shared memory in the shape of stories, knowledge, symbols, language, inspiring audiences to carry out the con carry on the conversation. Brands can use shared memory to create an entire ecosystem. Um, that, that, that's fascinating, isn't it, when you look at that and when you look at cultural things. And can I tell you something very quickly to see what you think of it? I read that paragraph, and do you know what instantly came into my mind? It was the Nike Joga Bonita sort of campaign from 23 years ago now. I think it was all to do with the 98 World Cup. And they did this wonderful TV advert with the Brazil football team playing football in an airport as they were travelling to the world, supposedly travelling to the World Cup. And I remember going on holiday that year with a group of friends and we had a football with us and a, a ghetto blaster with that soundtrack on there and we were rolling the football around the airport. And that to me is is absolutely what that brand was trying to get people to do and maybe convey through that particular campaign. It created this sort of something that people wanted to recreate that they felt that they could engage with themselves. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that what you're going to say is that when people read the document as I've done, things like that jump into their minds it, it prompts people to think oh yes what about that what about this um I, I, am i completely wide of the mark or i'm on the right lines here and what you want in the document to do yeah absolutely and uh you know a couple of things sprung to my mind when you were describing that and i and i guess the ultimate goal is something that's gonna that's gonna take off and that is gonna be um Kind of replicated by lots of people and, and actually the example that mike uh, mentioned earlier the J jerusalem is, is a is a great example of that it was something that was done and we've seen lots of them on on TikTok, you know recently where um somebody puts a dance routine and then you know it gets repeated and repeated and repeated because people jump on that bandwagon even something like the ice bucket challenge which you know is an older one now but um you know that that's a great example of people kind of coming together um, and for a great cause in, in that instance um, on that one. Absolutely. And I think with events is the nature of organising an event, if you think of the, the people involved in it and, and any experience, there's an awful lot of planning and thought that goes in up front. And I think the temptation is almost to see the event as the end, the finish line. Phew, we got there, it went brilliantly, everybody is delighted, all the feedback was brilliant and we all, you know, applaud each other and the reality is the live experience for the event is just the start it yeah. should be the start of a movement it, be, it should be the start of creating something and exactly as lucy said you know ice bucket challenge november and a lot of them it is um you know they there's a purpose behind it and it's something that that's what's the inner piece that's driving so jerusalem was about trying to just bring hope and joy and positivity and sometimes the purpose doesn't have to be a huge lofty thing it must be just something that is tangible, actionable, and actually something that people believe in and you are credible in that. So I do think, you know, when people often talk about purpose, I'm afraid I do get a bit cynical when it's, you know, um, someone goes, we're all in this, to all those, you know, adverts that you saw during the pandemic, we're all in this together, we all care, buy an X, Y, Z, you know, and just tagged on at the end. Because actually all it was trying to do is just put up a, you know, an ad with a, a little, and then still buy our product. Yeah. It was not action, yeah. and it does, does need to be done through action. And experiential is an incredibly powerful platform for doing that.
And I think that's where coming back to knowing your audience is, is really, really vital. Kind of having that um, that sort of finger on the pulse, if you like, of what your audience are feeling, what's important to them at that time, uh, what is relevant and how you can. I think genuinely brands should be approaching um, their marketing with how can we help our audiences? How can we do something that is really, really relevant for them? They care about it. We can help with that that cause. And then you're going to build a community and you're going to build a relationship with with those people who see that brand as being authentic. And, and it's interesting you mentioned that again with audiences and in the interest of parity, having mentioned a, a Nike campaign from, you know, 23 years ago in the report, there is uh, one of the case studies is, is Adidas um, and, and the, the Tango League community. Um, and again, something I've seen there, uh, one of the sentences, creating both grassroots and superstar storylines, which drove global reach. It's not just about portraying something that somebody something that's out of reach to somebody is not going to engage them as much as something that they feel was is within their grasp to engage within and looking at the adidas case study that's in the the, the um in the document um i think that's very relevant to there and and you may want to expand on some of that mike and 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 their involvement with this particular case study and, and how it came to be within your own document yeah, absolutely. So that brief originally started at, you know, every World Cup, Adidas launches their new ball, um, you know, in that case, um, for that World Cup. And it's usually, you know, and of course they have their ambassadors, you know, in this case, Messi and a whole, you know, kind of, you know, some of the planet's best footballers. And then you have the world's journalists and it's all photographed and everything. And it is something that people then just view as this, this is the new ball. And looking at this, you know, bringing something into culture, also bringing that connection. Adidas also have this very strong tango league. And it was actually about saying, let's not make it a one-day event, let's make it three days. Mm -hmm. And bring all the, um, the tango league players from around the world. And um, these are football-crazed teenagers who are huge talents for the future, who've come from incredibly diverse backgrounds, to suddenly get them in there to meet their, their absolute heroes, to play with their heroes on the World Cup final field with, you know, in the stadium with the ball and to create incredibly authentic content from that, which was very real because I think we've also got something that, you know, we've got these two uh, other sort of um, sort of feelings that we need to sort of also, I think, wrestle with came forward is one is that there's a real hope and I believe it's huge positive. I've got enormous confidence and in young people and young people you know are really um want a better more positive you know they're looking forward and um and that's what they're looking for from their brands but on the other side there's a tension where which is they're also equally more want more transparency they're more cynical so when they start seeing just a few celebrities put up there as a thing it suddenly starts becoming well actually how's that relevant to me that doesn't look like me that doesn't look like and, and that's something else I think brands need to actually connect with humans on a human level. It's lovely to create aspiration, mm -hmm. um, but there's got to be a step forward beyond aspiration. Um, you've got to make that connect those dots. Uh, and that's what we're really trying to do with the shared experience that it's, you know, it's accessible to all. And I think that that, that also goes as well for um, employers because what we're also seeing now is is more trends for actually younger people are wanting kind of more stable careers. So whereas over the last few years, what we've seen is, um, you know, people jumping around and spending a few years here and there and, ha and having kind of several different career paths and that being seen as a positive thing and, and a way forward. Actually, what young people are wanting now is, is more stability. And they're also getting um, more discerning about who they are prepared to to give their efforts to. So in the same way that we're seeing consumers wanting to buy from brands who share their values and who do good and give back to, whether it be communities or, or environmentally, um, we're also seeing that there's that pressure as well for employers to, um, to attract you know, talent and, and sort of keep hold of those people. Um, you need to also be having that kind of dialogue with your own employees, as well as the people who are buying your products. Um, guys, if you don't mind, I'd like to 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 look 
uh, again more specifically at some of the the content that's in this this report and and what we don't want to do is give too much away on the podcast and we want people to go and read this for themselves because it, it's a fabulous piece of piece of work um but again there's uh, i think it's page 20 of it looking at six key trends for the new experiential universe and gamified experiences is again one that jumped straight out at me because i scribbled about 10 minutes ago i scribbled down live music slash gaming opportunities question mark and lo and behold i scroll through the document and i see a quote from james kirkham chief business officer at defective records who says we've barely started to explore the opportunity of combining gaming and music this is another uh, prime example of of what i say the last 12 months has given us which is as as compressed our learning of a decade into probably 12 months and forced us to be a little bit more open to the possibilities of combining two different elements together that we may not have considered had we not been put in this position and this to me is a key one isn't it the gaming industry is potentially a huge market for these sort of virtual experiences mike absolutely and gamification i think is gaining to everything and what's at its core is too many years we've been passive viewers and you know just watching the screen looking to be engaged and as i said earlier you know there's such a demand for content and actually to produce amazing content is really difficult you know spielberg spends you know tens of millions to do that to engage you for an hour and a half so when brands expect to engage you for longer than 30 seconds from an ad there's an enormous amount that needs to be done and what game gaming has proven is the fact that you're in control, that you, there's a reward element to it, there's a challenge element to it, it really appeals to some of our inner human needs and desires to actually prove to ourselves or, you know, to give ourselves a bit of a challenge. And that's where I think a lot of the gamification, and I think it's is coming from, and I think that's where, you know, there's the one element which is obviously e-gaming, and, that's, and there's a real role for product placement, music, all of those links. Um, but I think gamification is actually techniques from that are gaming to all sorts of communication. So, for example, we're doing a lot in training and um, and helping both distance training um, through COVID, but also longer term. And gamification has become a key part of that. Also, virtual conferencing, et cetera, gamification has become a key content because nobody wants to just sit and stare at a screen anymore. Um, they want to feel involved. And, and I suppose what the gaming community have done, may, maybe unwittingly, um, is it, they, they've created something that economically presents a huge value and, and significance to the live events industry because they've got a community of people, and we're talking in the millions here, of a, 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 not a captive audience, but the audience is sat there ready to go. They're online, they're within that community, they are playing their whatever game that, that they're engaged with at that particular time. And that's fundamentally giving event people potentially, the, 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 you know, a, a, an audience ready made. Um, when you look at some of the stats in the report of the, the uh, Travis Scott taking his tour to uh, the Fortnite platform, uh, 12 million gamers... It debuted to 12 million gamers and was repeated to a total audience of 27.7 million. I mean, those numbers are, 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 are staggering. If you tried to create an event from scratch with that engagement, you'd be working for years on it and you'd have to have a huge budget. The gaming sector and the gaming economy is in some respects ready made for the event industry to dovetail with it. Okay. Yeah, and, and also, the, and, and going back to your original point about the music industry as well, and I think, um, you know, it's only just beginning to kind of really see what the impact of, of putting those two things together can be, because um, we know from working in, you know, the entertainment industry, obviously, that music artists have huge followings certain um certain types of gaming have have huge followings and, and as you say you put those two together um that's a lot of people <laughs> yeah and and really good for the, the the sort of amplification aspect you know we're we're very much believers that that the true immersive experiences are live experiences because you really can put somebody in a in a 360 degree um environment um but being able to then amplify that um and take it into kind of 
hybrid and and you know gamification is, is a great example here um that's that's when you kind of are really getting the sweet spot you'll see a case study here from formerly in berlin yes. where we put gaming and music together and it's immediately combining those together and i think you're going to get this convergence of so many of these passion points of people and you know sport and music are have always been traditionally seen as the big passion levers that people have a very clear you know um, genre and following and and i think gaming should really be added into that um but i, I think gaming we shouldn't just look at it as as i say esports or e-gaming it's actually the gaming engines as well so the virtual experiences we create creating now are using the gaming engine so that you actually can create a 3d world for your conference rather than just a stage backdrop you can create you, you can put yourself in any venue in the world our team in istanbul have been doing this where they literally can recreate you know make your conference inside the sistine chapel um, and because of gaming engine not only is it giving you photo quality you know real-time rendering of a 3d space but allows you to move through it and for it to react appropriately to whatever actions you are you take in and that's what i said about training you can actually make someone do the exercise and that will give different outcomes just like a computer game would do and in doing that you're taking what was previously a passive experience and you're making it an interactive experience and by getting the audience to participate and to curate their own journey and go around and do things at their own pace that learning experience is is so much um deeper mm. on a technical level just a question that's just popped into my head is how much how much consideration is given to the fact that most people even young people children and teenagers will have access to multiple devices um in terms of designing some of this these gamification elements you know i'm looking at you now on a computer i have a laptop i have a phone you know if i was involved in an online experience now i could be using another device to perhaps engage with an element of that content and is that a consideration that's been given either when doing this report or when you've actually been working with your own clients into the the multiple um device uh ecosystem that we all live in now yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's what that actually results in is a, a very high propensity for distraction. So you could well be multitasking, you know, having a conversation here, emails popping up over there, lots of different things um, going on, which is why then gamification um, and, and all the shared experience kind of um, learnings that we've been talking about become really important when you're, when you're doing any kind of virtual experience because mm -hmm. it's way too easy for people to wander off. So you've got to have you know, regular prompts and regular interaction and get them involved and get them to feel part of it and get them talking to people um, to, to make sure that they, they stay with it. Yeah. It's content is king, and and then the technical side is about taking barriers um, away, and the barriers is downloading an app. You know, no one wants to download yet another app, download another yet another piece of software. So everything our in-house teams call cassette, uh, and they do. This is their world, and everything actually. You know, the first step is to make sure that it is open instantly from a URL address. So you do yeah. not need any software, you don't need any app. And, and the base is that it always can start with one of these first and then build up to a desktop or a laptop or any other device. But I think that is critical. The technology is anything that has to download an app going forward or download a platform, I think is, um, you know, the, sort of, um, the future is literally that it lives in the cloud and it's straight through URL address. And that's all the virtual experiences we use in the gaming engine. So you don't have to buy the gaming engine. You, it goes through, we've developed a thing called Virtual View, uh, a platform called Virtual View. And it's and that is, you can down, it comes, connects in seconds just as if you connect into a website. But actually what you're going into is a gaming engine uh, written in, um, in one of the gaming um, programs. Mm, the, the, the guys, the, the, we're, we're rattling through time today, but there's something that I really want to touch on as, as sort of my the last thing that I'd like to pull out of the, the white paper um, on the podcast today. And that's one of the, the these six key uh, trends. And it's retail, 
the store as media. And the reason I want to pull this out is this is something that I mentioned on an episode of the podcast probably three or four weeks ago, in that retail has taken a hammering. You know, the shops have been closed. If you weren't shopping online before, you are now because you've had no choice. And ultimately, that's going to make the desire to go back into shops for people to do their shopping in person an e- e- even sort of bigger decision for the for the consumer to have to make. So to me, I said a few weeks ago, there's a huge opportunity for retail here to really look at the experience that they give shoppers, to really look at how they can transform their retail spaces into something that's more akin to going to an event. Um, it's great to see that this is something that you guys have really looked at in more detail here. And I wonder if, if before we wrap up today, we can just look at the retail side of things. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is something that we've been working with brands on for a while and, and has again been accelerated by the pandemic. But this ideal that that retail, it can't be just transactional anymore mm. because you can buy pretty much anything online if, if you really want to. Um, mm. You've got to go there for the experience. What can't you get online where you can't get you know really good guidance from you know qualified knowledgeable staff you can't get really the the sense of the brand and what I mean by that is kind of what does the brand stand for what are its values what's exciting about it um you know what partnerships does it have like all of all of that kind of really rich sense of of who the brand is you can get that you can get that if you go into a more experienced um kind of environment so the use of bricks and mortar it's got to work harder it's got to evolve it's got to give people that kind of as you say deeper experience um in order to evolve There, there hasn't been kind of massive retail evolution in the same way that there has for lots of other industries when you look specifically at at bricks and mortar obviously the online side of things is is different but i think what we're seeing now is that brands are going to have to make that shift but actually it's really exciting because there's so many possibilities and Mm. and you know even once the store is closed of an evening can it then become an event space can it then become you know somewhere where you're holding um those types of events which could then be be delivered as virtual content but you're maximizing that space and what you're doing it what you're doing with it and the messages that people are able to take from it Um, um, Mike, what, one thing that I, I, I jotted down a few weeks ago was that in business, if time is money for the consumer, time is life. You know, we, we, we've now had 12 months where we've been as consumers and people re- restricted from doing things by being forced to shop online and people perhaps realizing how easy that is. There's going to have to be a very good reason for them to sacrifice two, three, four hours of their time where they could be spending it with family or friends or doing something that they really enjoy. There's going to have to be a really good reason for them to have to choose not to shop online and to go into that store. And and as I said, to me, for the consumer, the key thing is time is now life once lockdown is lifted. Um, and, and that's what, what shops and environments like that need to be focusing on. Absolutely. And that's a lovely saying, uh, time is life. And um, the... Retail is always traditional, or traditionally, retail has been um, really valued in how many pounds per square foot they can sell. Mm-hmm. So every square foot of the retail space is how many pounds of merchandise can we sell, and that's now moved online. So all transactional element is online because it's more convenient, it's easier. Every reason we've just given is it, but actually online, it's increasingly more difficult to find things. So you feel like you've got a million choices, and you can search. But obviously, the way the, the data tracking works is that once you've searched for something, and I'm sure we've all experienced it, you go and look for that white shelf, and for the next two weeks, you followed it around the internet by that white shelf. <laughs> your, search, your ability to find something on the internet, and just try it. Go and look for a camera. Go and look for something. You will keep being given and fed a diet of that same product. Um, and... It's actually interesting, my my 17-year-old son, but he said this to me when when he was about 11. He said, I don't search for anything online. I see online as being a library. It's You don't go and find stuff. I mean, you can go down rabbit holes on YouTube and things like that, and you discover new things. But all it's doing is feeding you a diet of what it really thinks you want because it's profiled you. And it's profiled you. And so essentially your choice continually is getting narrowed and narrowed and narrowed. There's no more serendipity. You think it's serendipity. 
But what it's doing is it's actually just going, you were interested in this, 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 and this. Therefore, James, you're now interested in that. I'm going to feed you a diet of that. So we start living in these tiny little echo chambers, even though we're in this enormous world of the internet. So I do think um, the high street, its role now is going to be partly entertainment. It's going to be a social space. It's where we meet, we go to a coffee shop, we do this. But then we pop into a shop because it's interesting. I explore, I discover. And to Lucy's point, I then suddenly have a feeling about what the brand stands for. Um, and so, you know, I don't know what that's will mean for department stores, but do you need to have zones so that actually you then can speak to an expert who can, um, actually can really guide you through something and you can tangibly feel it because there is an audience that still wants to be able to touch and feel what they're buying. Because on the flip side of it is deliveries are great. They're a real pain sending stuff back. And um, you end up, and I don't know about any of you, but you end up with a room full of Amazon empty boxes. You that you have to away. And I've started having an issue with that you know, when it's like um, time you, is... You order a new key ring and it comes in a box, you know, th 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 that size. Yeah. And when time is life, I don't really know if I want to be spending my time going sitting in a queue um, at my local tip trying to get rid of all this cardboard. <laughs> you know, for a so is online is definitely where it's going to go. But all I would say it's transactional. I know what I want. It's a hassle to buy. I don't want to go out and get it. I'll get it delivered. Uh, it's for those little trinkets I needed a new door handle. Book it online. I'm not going to go and sit and be in queue for hours. Yeah. But the high street can actually be a highly engaging place when you're looking for that gift for somebody. And also entertainment. It can be entertaining. Um, you know, you used to call it retail therapy. You know, yeah. that, so long as it's a social space. And the shop, uh, people like Westfield have been doing, you know, they're one of the world's biggest. Um, they've been doing this for a long time, understanding the connection between food, leisure, um, you know, being able to watch a film. To, it's not about just going in there and buying stuff. It's about exploring. And and shared experiences, right? To, to, yeah. to bring it back to that. We know exactly from right. from all of the you know, all of lockdown that people can't wait actually to, to get back out. And you know, that there will be a different approach for, for different people, not one size fits all in terms of kind of this roadmap back to normality. But for a lot of people, they're desperate to actually get out and and get back to doing things um, in, in the flesh and, and in bricks and mortar. So uh, we're hopeful that there will be a, a huge return to the high streets in the same way as we've seen massive demand for, you know, festivals that are selling out within minutes because people are crying out to get back to the shared experiences that, that we've missed. Absolutely. Shared Experiences, How to Thrive in a Post-Pandemic Experience Economy has been published by TRO, the Shared Experience Agency. Um, Mike, perhaps you could just tell our podcast listeners where they can um, read this report in full if they want to do so. Please, um, if you have a moment, do take time to go and um, have a read and hopefully it inspires you, it interests you, it's something we're very passionate about. And you can find it at tro.com. It's that simple. There we go. And if you're watching the video, we've just popped the uh, the website address up on the video um, as well for anybody who wants to go and, and do that. And I'm sure if you search all the usual social media platforms, you will find TRO on there. Find out a bit, a bit more about what these guys do in terms of creating these shared experiences for their own clients. But I would urge everybody who listens to this this podcast to go and read that report. It's been brilliantly written. There's clearly a lot of time and effort and thought gone into it. And like all good documents, um, it, it strikes me as something that you can read in small snippets. You don't just have to sit there and read the whole thing in one lump. I'm sure that would be great if you did do that, and I'm sure it would be easy to do so. But there are loads of key takeaways that you can get just by glancing through it like I've done today whilst we've been actually recording today's podcast. There's loads of stuff in there that will prompt ideas. So um, go and do that. We've been joined by TRO's CEO, Mike Worley Birch and client partner, Lucy Neal today. Guys, thanks very much for joining the podcast. Thank you so much for having us. It's been <laughs> No problem at all. It's been great to have you on. If you are listening to today's podcast on your favourite po podcast platform, if I can get the words out, um, head over to eventindustrynews.com. Uh, plenty of stuff on there to look at as well. Uh, sustainability features, um, specific reports, latest news from all the different vertical strands within our 
big entity that we call the events industry. Um, of course, if you're already on there and you're watching this video, then hello to you. Thank you very much for joining us. You can get all of the previous episodes of the podcast. I think we're about to about 230 now via your favourite podcast platform and listen to it whilst you're out in your little walk enjoying hopefully what is going to be the start of a, a very very nice spring and summer period as we uh, exit this lockdown that we've been in for 12 months now um, Mike Lucy thanks for joining us today good luck with the ongoing success of this white paper and the report um, good luck with everything that you're involved with this year and we uh, we'd love to have you back on the podcast again in the future to talk about some of the projects specifically that you're involved with so uh, hope to see you back again here soon thank you, thank you James Thank and, you. Uh, thanks very much for everybody for joining us. Uh, we'll see you on the next edition of the podcast. See you soon. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.